Good evening and welcome to ATV. I'm Saad Asfour, your host. Uh, this evening I'm very excited, I'm privileged and pleased to have with me Dr. Uh, Hatim Kanani from Palestine, the author of Chief Complaint, a country doctor tales of life in Galilee. Hello doctor and welcome to the show. Thank you. I'm Thank glad you for to be coming. Here. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, Doctor Hatem, you were born in Palestine, in uh, Arabe, in, uh, in the village of Arabe, Arabe in Galilee, and uh, Fil Jalil, and yes. uh, that was during the time between 1936 and 39, where the first Intifada, the nation uh, uh, wide Intifada against British. That's Can true. you tell us a little bit about your childhood and how did you, what you go, yes. what you went through during that time? Okay, well, I uh, grew up in a uh, uh, typical uh, farming uh, community, a uh, small village of uh, a little over 1,500 people at the time that I was born. And uh, uh, actually, um, on my 11th birthday, uh, uh, Israel was decla declared its its in independence, and uh, so the Nakba day actually uh, coincides with my birthday. Wow! Uh, <laughs> so it is uh, quite a reminder, yeah. But um, uh, my uh, childhood was really not that eventful uh, till uh, we finished eighth grade. Uh, except for the uh, events of 1948. And then after that, uh, I w went to high school in the city of Nazareth. And uh, after finishing high school, um, uh, I taught for school for two years. Oh, you were so a teacher too? Yes, I was a, a teacher oh, for wow. two years. Oh, wow, good, good. Yeah, before I came to the United States to study so, medicine. So you came to the United States 1960 and you went to Harvard to get your education? Uh, well, I didn't go directly to Harvard. I started in South Dakota, then moved to Hawaii, oh. then moved to Harvard, <laughs> to Boston okay. and uh, Cambridge. Uh, oh, that's good. Um, so, and then you end up in Harvard and you earned your medical degree and you became a doctor. That's right, and I did also a degree in public health as well. Well, tell us, how did you make it all the way from uh, Araba village? At, at that time, I, I wouldn't know how would the money situation was, yes. and how did you afford mm. it? Well, let me uh, tell you, I, I, I think in my opinion, the, uh, the jump from the village uh, uh, situation to g attending my s high school in Nazareth Okay. was probably a bigger hurdle than coming to the United States oh. uh, because uh, I was among the, you know, the earliest uh, uh, boys or girls, uh, no, no girls at the time, but the earliest boys from my village to attend high school. And it was a very expensive uh, proposition for uh, uh, the uh, uh, farming community, members of the farming community who lived uh, on subsistence farming. There was mm. no really cash uh, uh, flow, uh, flow in anywhere, <laughs> I'm sure. <laughs> anywhere. That was hard. And so to have to rent a, a room in Nazareth and to pay for books and for clothes and for was a very expensive proposition. So expensive that my father essentially uh, uh, sold most of his farming land other than the uh, olive grove that we owned. Uh, he sold everything to put us through high school. Wow. And then, then uh, came the idea of, uh, I mean, I uh, uh, decided that I'm coming to the United States to study medicine. Of course, you had to go to college first and then apply to medical school. Right. And so coming to the United States to uh, do college here uh, was again a major hurdle. I was assisted uh, with, by uh, a, a couple uh, who uh, were childless and they, they did a lot of traveling around the world wow. and I met them in the marketplace of Nazareth and we exchanged addresses and so on. So they assisted me really in the process of applying for a visa. I came to the United States with $500. Wow. It was at the time possible for students to, to work start. and support themselves yeah. through college and I did 
the first two years, just for your information, I worked in the uh, oil fields in Wyoming uh, mm -hmm. as a roughneck. That's the term f that you use for a uh -huh. worker on the drill, uh, uh, drilling for, uh, uh, for oil. And uh, supported right. myself through this. Eventually, after uh, my BA and first two years of medicine, I uh, married and my wife was teaching and she supported me, put me through medical school. And plus, I always managed to get a scholarship. Well, sounds like you've been lucky all your life. I mean, you always had the right assistant to start off on the right foot. Thank you very much. That's yes, good. I, okay. I feel <laughs> so you got your um, health doctor mm. degree from mm. Harvard, and you went back in 1973, and you became uh, the uh, resident physician for your uh, hometown, and you were handling like 50,000 Palestinian people living there. You were treating them. Oh. You were their only mm. medical. You were the only doctor in town. That's that's very true. Actually, I returned in 1970 and only and, and uh, had to work as a, a, a physician uh, both uh, i worked in the uh, maternal child health clinics in the area and in uh, after hours i uh, had to see uh, patients in my uh, general practice that was in 1970 and then 1973 i became the district physician with the ministry of health uh, and that uh, really uh, my responsibilities were for the entire Western Galilee, not only for my village. And uh, uh, I had uh, this idea that I was going really to make a difference for my people. And uh, uh, I did make some difference in terms of providing uh, medical care for my community at the beginning. But the bigger issues of uh, public health, the bigger issues of uh, really uh, preventive medicine and uh, sanitation and uh, uh, the, the uh, school health project and so on, all of the b bigger uh, public health issues, I didn't feel that I was making a dent really. And I quickly realized that though I was part of the system, uh, the system was set up to really not deliver the needed care and the needed services to my community. Right. And that's when I actually, with uh, four other, with three other physicians, we established a non-governmental organization and we started working on, other, on our own, uh, trying to provide uh, the needed services to our communities. Are these non-governmental organizations like Etijah and uh, what's the other one, Adla? Are Adala. they still existing? Uh, Adala still exists and so does uh, the Galilee Society that I uh, was, the, uh, 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 I and, and three other physicians established. They are still uh, existing and uh, Adala does great work in terms of uh, the legal defense of, of uh, the special issues of our, of our communities. And the Galilee Society also still going strong, doing uh, health education, and also doing uh, uh, especially uh, uh, research on specific issues that uh, uh, concern our communities, such as environmental health issues. and. Uh, that That's great. Uh, mm. I see you started off your career by uh, offering significant uh, contribution to your country. And I've heard a lot of people, they come from other countries and they go to Harvard and they graduate, but they never go back. So how do you feel about that? You went back well, and you did what you wanted to do. Is this, was, this your aim? This is your goal? What well, you did? Uh, uh, let me tell you, I mean, uh, when I finished uh, my medical education, uh, there were several opportunities and offers for jobs and um, and and the couple that I mentioned earlier offered to uh, adopt me formally and I inherited them and 
He's a banker, and his wife is a uh, college uh, professor at the time. Wow. And uh, uh, it was very attractive, the idea of be, staying around. Plus, I did my internship, and I married a girl from Hawaii. And uh, Hawaii is a beautiful place to settle. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was very, as I say, very attractive. However, there was this commitment early on. I suppose if I were left on my own, I probably wouldn't have become a doctor. But my family and the community around me, since I was a little child, since I went to first grade, they started putting this idea in my head that I was doing well in school, I must be smart, I'm going to be a doctor. Mm -hmm. And uh, so when I grew up, I couldn't get that idea out of my mind. And I was really uh, convinced by these by the input from the surroundings uh, that that I am going to be a doctor, I'm going to go back and serve my community and uh, really change things. And that's how I felt when I finished my training here. And uh, my life would have been really meaningless without having delivered on that commitment and on that debt to my community. Okay, so you are retired now, but I did hear that before you retired, you were treating all the people from your country for free. Is that true? Well, uh, did you charge not, them, or not, didn't charge them not, much, or not something exactly. like that? Exactly. I mean, uh, uh, there was a lots of uh, um, give and take in a rural community in a Palestinian village culture. Really, uh, and, and again, going back to the uh, uh, beginning of my life, it, money didn't mean much. It, mm -hmm. You really uh, supported each other and you, you uh, 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 cared for each other. And so the money part wasn't the, uh, uh, the, real, <laughs> the real part of the, of the uh, 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 medical practice that I led. I never charged any of my patients, more than $10, not per visit, mm -hmm. but $10 per life, per episode of oh. illness, uh, okay. regardless how many times that requires them to come back. like one time fee and back. that's it. One time, essentially. Wow. And so that's uh, uh, how it went. That is amazing. Uh, that well. is so nice. It's really a true story. So now... Let, um, me, let me just put in a, uh, just a, a plug sure, here ahead. that uh, uh, I never felt that I was doing anybody any favor because it was a two-way process. Uh -huh. I was receiving, you know, the love for my children and the, 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 and, and the uh, care and the respect and the, uh, all the yeah. favors that people around me in the village were uh, offering me. That was much more than uh, uh, I could buy with whatever money I would have yeah. made if I was out for to make money. That's excellent, doctor. And now I'd like to talk about your new book you just uh, published, a Chief Complaint. Yes. And this is your second book. The That's first, true. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about this book and what's the message or purpose for writing this book? Okay. Uh, let me uh, go about it a little bit in detail. When I uh, decided to re retire from the practice of medicine and public health, mm -hmm. uh, I felt that I had the potential, the ability still to uh, uh, serve my community. And uh, I'm talking about my community in the larger sense, mm -hmm. not only my family or my village, but the Palestinian uh, citizens of Israel as a group. And we are now about a, a, a million and a half uh, mm -hmm. currently. And so I felt uh, in, in, in comparison to 8 million. Yeah, we are about 20% of the total population of, yes. of Israel. But in uh, 2003, when I decided to retire, I thought that I could still serve in a different way. And I uh, really was convinced and still am convinced that uh, w the, greatest, the greatest service I can offer is to try to tell the world about my community's existence, to narrate to the world about, to narrate our truth to the world. 
very few people ever heard before about uh, the Palestinian minority mm -hmm. or the Palestinian community yes. in Israel. And so I took on this as part, I'm not the only one, I mean, uh, we have a lot of uh, a great uh, uh, writers, writers and poets yes. and Mahmoud Darwish and uh, Emil Habibi and uh, uh, feel Zayed, and I can uh, uh, continue mentioning names forever, but there are, are uh, these, essentially most of these people uh, uh, really spoke to Arab readership. And I thought, in essence, if you think about it, decisions about our life and our, about our future are made by American voters right. who elect whoever they put in Congress and elect the administration or the president and so on. And with that, very few Americans really know anything about us and about the way the state treats us, about the actual, uh, the actual uh, existence of apartheid. I mean, it's no longer a no-no word to use. Israel is an apartheid state. That's we right. are second-class cit citizens. We uh, uh, never were equal to the Jewish ma majority. Uh, and, uh, you know, we, we vote and that's what they hold over our head, you know, you, uh, it's a democracy, you go vote and, uh, <laughs> but it is uh, rigged in such a way that there's no way that we uh, 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 can really on our own achieve equality to the Jewish majority as long as the state has really laws that discriminate against us, they're about over 50 laws, and you mentioned Adala earlier. Adala is a source, uh, A-D-L-A-H dot net. That's their website. I mean, they, they have a listing of all the discriminatory laws uh, that exist in Israel, and uh, one can visit there and see uh, for himself, for herself. Okay. So uh, all I'm saying is that really, really we, we uh, uh, cannot change Israel from within on our own. And that's why my target is to reach to the public in the United States, the English, average English reader, speaker and that readers. is uh, an English speaker in the United States, and try to put my message of what I know about my people and what are their dreams and what their conditions are and what they have suffered so far and so on, to put this in the hands uh, of the uh, English readership in the United States and, and have them, uh, 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 you know, uh, get a little bit of information. I tried that first by writing a book of a, an autobiography. It's called actually the, uh, uh, it's called a, a Doctor in Galilee. Okay, so that and was your is, first book. That's the first book in 2008. It came out in London. And uh, after a while and after thinking about it uh, uh, at length, uh, I reached the conclusion that more people who are not, you know, politicians or literary figures or whatever, the average reader uh -huh. really reads more fiction uh -huh. than uh, well, accounts uh, of... of uh, I read uh, 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 most of the chief complaint book and I noticed uh, short vignettes in here. Uh, so what's the difference between the two books? Because I remember yeah. that one was published in 2008 and this one this year. This year so yes. what's the difference? Okay. The first book, which is A Doctor in Galilee, is really a, a straightforward autobiography. And it focuses mainly on my struggle to deliver, to, to improve the health condition of my community. This is sort of the focus of it. And speaks about my career, and my, about my studying in the United States earlier, and my career, and my establishment, establishing the Galilee Society, which is, I consider, my major achievement in uh, professionally. And uh, uh, with, with the new book, as I said, it is a fiction it is actually fictionalized reality. Okay. I mean, I'm drawing on my experience as a physician in my village and telling the stories 
behind the disease, behind the uh, people that came to seek uh, my uh, uh, professional help. Yeah. And uh, um, the, the, uh, the book is made up of short stories it's really that interesting. are full of little vignettes, as we said, that actually happened. But I collected those together and created a story out of yeah. a series of, a string of those little events. And I made a, a story out of that. And there are a total of 17 stories in it. Yeah, I noticed mm -hmm. there are different titles for each one of the stories. Yes. That's beautiful. This is very interesting. I really enjoyed reading this book. Thank you. But how Thank did you, you come up with the title? You okay. know, the uh, Chief Complaint. <laughs> this is really okay. interesting name. Chief Complaint is a, uh, actually a medical uh, concept. Uh, physicians at the time I practiced, at any rate, it's no longer it was more fashionable common. to do it today. But uh, uh, at the uh, traditionally, the patient's chart after the first thing, after the name and the information about the age and so on, the first thing that you see is chief complaint, uh -huh. which means what is the patient coming to me for? Uh, what ails him? And so chief complaint is uh, uh, the uh, title that I came up with, right, actually inspired by a book that is written by uh, uh, one of the mm, best known books of uh, Primo Levi. Primo Levi is a, uh, uh, is, is a, a Jewish, uh, Italian Jewish chemist, I believe, but he uh, survived the Holocaust and he wrote a book that's called The Periodic Table. The Periodic Table for a Chemist is equivalent to my chief complaint. Okay. And I, when I read his book uh, uh, on the advice of a friend, um, I, I the idea. developed this concept. And also, if you think about it, I'm trying behind those vignettes and stories, behind those, I am trying to share with the reader the chief complaint of my community. Right. Our loss. Well, of of, uh, uh, of of our national independence, and more importantly, even I, in my view, our loss of land, and of our of our uh, or the attempt at at making us lose our culture and our dignity. Yeah, and so that's it's, the it's, chief complaint of my community. Yeah, the name it's pretty much covers both terms in Arabic and in English, uh -huh. as you said, uh, from medical point of view. And in Arabic, it's called الشكوى الرئيسية في العربي. So it mm. covers it both way based on all these stories. It covers it on both terms. Yes. That's, that's mm. really good. That's interesting. Now, it, it, with uh, your permission, it actually uh, uh, uses the uh, uh, medical uh, style of uh, interviewing a ba patient. You, you go start with the head, and you go down the head, the eyes, the, oh, wow. the, the neck, the chest, the, and so the, uh, if, if you look at the, at the uh, table of contents, uh, it starts with, the, uh, the, after the preface, high fever, chills, hair loss, headache, mm -hmm. hearing loss, painful sw swallowing, neck swelling, and so on and so forth. The last thing is limping, something to do with the feet yeah. and the legs. And wow, so it, that's good. With yeah. the few minutes we have left, can you tell us what kind of hopes and what kind of um, the Palestinian people have for their future, to encourage their future? You know, You're talking based about on the your, all your study, we'll go back to the Palestinian mm. from your homeland. Uh, I presume you talking about the Palestinian. Uh, citizens of Israel, of Israel yes. my community, right. as I call them. Of course, the wider community that I belong to is the Palestinian people. But uh, for th mm, the purposes of this book and for the purposes of my efforts, it is the Palestinian minority in Israel, the Palestinian citizens of Israel, that I call my community. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, uh, the hope for our community is really not independent from the hope 
of the larger Palestinian community. Uh, it is not really possible to continue uh, uh, and, and be satisfied with the way we have been treated as second-class citizens in Israel. And so uh, uh, what is on the horizon is something actually even more uh, hopeful and more promising than many people uh, think. Uh, uh, let me just uh, put it on the, on the table. Uh, I think the uh, BDS movement, boycott, divestment, and sanctions, that movement that started in 2005 has uh, three components. The uh, uh, actualization of the right of the Palestinian refugees, the right of return. The second is the end, ending the occupation in the Palestinian occupied territories, the West Bank, Gaza, and uh, Jerusalem. And the third part is full equality for the Palestinian citizens of Israel. And those three are uh, the, uh, con interconnected as the goals of the BDS movement. And at the end, that is going, when you put the three components together, that is going to result in what I really hope for, and I think it is going to happen, and it is the uh, idea of one state west of the Jordan River, between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean. One state with one democratic, uh, 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 non-religious state, uh, uh, and uh, uh, with equality for all its citizens. That's wonderful. I hope your message will get through to all, to everybody. Thank uh, you. Unfortunately, we're running out of time. Uh, one thing I want to mention that Dr. Hatem will be speaking in San Francisco at the Arab Culture Center on May the 20th at 7 p.m. That's in San Francisco Arab Culture Center. Please join him. Thank you, doctor, for coming today. And we'll watch us again next week for part two with Dr. Hatem. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Good night.